So what are the factors contributing? So this is one area I will go a little bit in detail so everyone understands the basic uh, respiratory physiology. So we have immaturity of the respiratory control as a predominant factor when it comes to central apnea. The respiratory reflexes play a role both in central and uh, obstructive apnea. And the upper airway factors play a role in obstructive apnea mainly. And we have associated conditions as well. So uh, the factors implicated in the pathogenesis can be central, which includes decreased central chemosensitivity. We'll be discussing a little bit about each of these as well as we go on. We have the hypoxic ventilatory depression, which is a kind of a paradoxical response to hypoxia. Upregulation of the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this is one of the key mechanisms of caffeine's action. Adenosine is a inhibitory neurotransmitter and caffeine inhibits adenosine receptors. And it's a delayed uh, central nervous system development. That's why under 28 weeks, it's almost routine to have apnea. In terms of peripheral reflex pathways, we may have decreased or increased carotid body activity. We may have the active laryngeal chemo reflex. I mean, when we debate the role of uh, reflex role, this comes in a lot. And we have the excessive bradycardic response, the vagal tone, which is predominant, and also the coordination of the upper uh, airway musculature as well comes in here. So this is a simple overview of the respiratory control. So we have the respiratory centers in the medulla and the pons. We'll be looking at it in the next slide as to what the centers are. And we have the central control of the breathing. So this is a volitional control. We can hold our breath as we want. We also can control the breathing uh, subconsciously when we speak, for example, or when we are singing. So that involves control of breathing, but that doesn't need much thought or input. So both these higher controls come from the cortex. We have pain and emotional stimuli acting through the hypothalamus. So when a baby is anxious, so when the, there is a pain stimulus, they may hold their breath and that is related to this area. We have the central and peripheral chemoreceptors. So the central chemoreceptors on the surface and the CSF pH and the carbon dioxide levels are going to affect this. So we learn about this when we talk about why we shouldn't use bicarbonate to correct severe acidosis immediately because you may have paradoxical central acidosis that's through the effect on these chemoreceptors. And we have receptors in the muscles and joints. That is why you breathe more when you are exercising. In a baby, even feeding is an exercise. And we have the peripheral chemoreceptors. The ones in the aortic body deal more with the blood pressure regulation but the ones in the carotid bodies deal more with the oxygen carbon dioxide related changes. So the carotid bodies are more sensitive to oxygen while the central chemoreceptors are more related to carbon dioxide and the hydrogen and the pH. In addition to that, we have the stretch receptors in the lung and the irritant receptors which feed back in a negative way. So they inhibit breathing when they are stimulated. So we have these centers, we have the pons where we have the nemotaxic center. So the nemotaxic center can override the apneustic center and that is related to increasing the respiratory rate when you need it. The apneustic center is a more primitive center and this is responsible for the gasping breathing we take in secondary apnea babies. Just before the secondary apnea, we see the gasping breathing. In a terminally ill child, we often see the gasping breathing. That's because the other centers are failing and the apneustic center takes over as a last resort. So the pre-Bodzinger complex is in the upper uh, medulla, just above the ventral uh, uh, respiratory group. And this is now the respiratory pacemaker and all the other feedback mechanisms work through this to some extent. The dorsal and ventral respiratory group is also related to respiratory control. So it is these neurons and the, these centers we are talking of as immature when it comes to premature babies, but it's not just the central immaturity, it's also the different reflexes that act with it. So these are the various called in a nutshell. So we have the different centers which we described now and the pontine and medullary uh, receptors as well as the cortical control. When we come to the central uh, sensory input system, we have the mechanoreceptors. We'll be looking at the reflexes in the next couple of slides. The metaboreceptors which are related to skeletal muscle and the exercise related in increase in activity and so on. Uh, peripheral chemoreceptors, we discussed that, and the central chemoreceptors as well. And finally, the action happens through the lungs for the gas exchange. The diaphragm and the external intercostals are the primary uh, inspiratory muscle group, and the abdominal muscles and the internal intercostals control expiration, which is mostly a passive process, but you may have to be uh, active in certain situations. Uh, 
and the upper airway muscles, the coordination between the upper airway muscles and the diaphragm contraction, these are all uh, factors which cause obstructive apnea because upper airway muscles are more sensitive to the inhibitory actions and so we may have obstructive apnea in the premature babies. So the fetal respiration, the baby does breathe when they are in the womb, the fetus does breathe and this fetal breathing movements are very important for lung growth as uh, we know in conditions where the fetal breathing is inhibited, the lung may not develop normally. So diaphragmatic hernia is an example where the intestinal contents in the chest don't allow the lung to have the fetal movements, uh, breathing movements, and so they don't grow well. And the fetal respiration is non-continuous. It's mostly seen during the rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, because the fetus is in a hypoxic environment, hypoxia inhibits the central drive in utero. And uh, the biphasic response to hypoxia that we see in the premature neonate could be a continuation of this, just like persistent pulmonary hypertension is an extension of the in utero state. The paradoxical hypoxic response inhibition of the breathing when the baby's hypoxic is more active in the preterms uh, due to the uh, in utero continuation. We also have delayed maturation of the synaptic connections in the brainstem in the babies with apnea. So when you compare premature babies with apnea with those who don't have apnea, we see a significant difference in the maturation overall. Uh, neurotransmitters like uh, GABA, adenosine inhibit the respiratory drive. And we have an altered response to hypo and hypercapnia in babies with apnea. So this is an illustration of why this altered difference is there and how it works. So in a normal baby, for example, the CO2, when it rises from 35 to say 40 plus, the baby starts increasing their minute ventilation as a compensatory mechanism. And when we have infants with apnea, there is a shift to right of the CO2 responsiveness. So we have uh, an increase in the threshold. So from 35, the starting point goes to 45 plus. And at the same time, the response is also relatively less. So the slope of the curve is uh, flatter. Both these aspects are clearly seen when you have uh, infants with apnea. So uh, one of the importance of this is in relation of uh, risk of sudden infant death. We will see later that the babies with apnea of prematurity do not really show a significant difference uh, when it comes to SIDS rate because these maturations happen by 43 weeks while the major risk for sudden infant death happens after 46 weeks. So this reduced CO2 responsiveness is one of the factors that leads to sudden death, but it's not necessarily due to the prematurity. So the respiratory reflexes that we discussed, the stretch receptors in the intercostal area, there is the intercostal phrenic inhibitory reflex. When the chest wall is distorted, the baby has a response by brief pause in the respiration. This is a central effect as I showed you in the earlier slides. And this is very important because during the rapid uh, eye movement sleep, for example, the baby is relatively hypotonic, the chest wall can be easily distorted. And by reducing the distortion of the chest wall is one of the mechanisms how CPAP acts. And it's also the mechanism by which your uh, prone position is going to help the baby. The herring brewer reflex is also active. We have the uh, inflate, inflation related herring brewer reflex is the more important component. So here the stretch inhibits the baby's breathing. And uh, irritant reflexes, there is a noxious gas stimulation which can induce apnea. When there is a sudden uh, burst of cold air, the baby may start holding the breath. We also have the uh, trigeminal reflex where if you hold the mask too tight on the face, we may have uh, vagal stimulation and the baby may become apneic as well. In terms of the upper airway chemo reflex, we also call it the laryngeal chemo reflex. The interarytenoid receptors, when they are stimulated, they cause apnea. So this happens if the area comes in contact with water droplets or milk. As you can see, the foot pipe is very short in babies and the larynx is fairly anterior as well. So anything that is refluxing or when the baby has secretions, both these can irritate that area and the baby can have. That's why secretions can cause apnea as well or reflex can produce apnea. The chest wall, we described the importance of the chest wall in relation to the stretch receptors and the intercostal uh, phrenic reflex. A high compliance chest wall is more distorted. So the more premature the baby, the chest wall muscles are not well developed. So you have higher distortion. The hypopharyngeal muscle tone is also reduced in preterm babies. And we discussed uh, rapid eye movement sleep or active sleep compared to quiet sleep. So in quiet sleep, we have a regular breathing pattern and there is less chest wall distortion as the tone is maintained. However, in rapid eye movement sleep, we have a reduced tone of the muscles, chest wall distortion, and the tone of the airway muscles is reduced. So we get more apnea during the rapid eye movement sleep as well. So uh, this is about the respiratory control and the factors related to the apnea itself. 
we also have other contributing factors. So some of these are controversial as you'd all recognize. So gastroesophageal reflex has been studied in umpteen uh, different uh, research uh, projects. No one has really clone, shown a clear response. You do have uh, physiologic and logical plausibility and that's why some of us still treat in the extreme cases, but routine treatment is an absolute no-no because the med medicines you use to treat reflex are not good for the baby. In the first case, if you are using acid suppression, that's shown to increase the risk of uh, NEC or even sepsis. And uh, motility agents have uh, effects on the heart. Cisapride was an example where we started using it and we burnt our hands. And uh, even though some other medicines are available, you don't need to routinely treat because this is physiologic as well. So you address the reason for it. You can uh, adjust the feeding interval. You can adjust the position of the baby, but avoid using medication. Uh, in terms of anemia, there is clear evidence that when you have a better oxygen carrying, uh, your hypoxia is reduced, so you have less reason for apnea. So if a baby is sick and has apnea with hemoglobin, uh, which is significantly lower, you may have a slightly higher threshold than what you would use. There are many studies which are looking at the transfusion thresholds and recently um, you don't want to go to extreme uh, lower cutoffs but at the same time you don't want to transfuse too aggressively as well. So you have to be uh, reasonably uh, conservative when it comes to bloodletting as well as when it comes to transfusion cutoffs. But a baby who has recurrent apnea, you may have a slightly higher threshold than a baby who doesn't have, especially if the apnea is clinically troublesome and not responding to the other measures. If there is airway abnormality like laryngeal edema or narrowing in the post-extubation period, you may induce apnea as well. And uh, thermoregulation is an important component because if the baby is overheated, they may have apnea. If the baby is cold, they may have apnea as well. So you want to keep them in the thermoneutral zone. You want to keep the settings as close to the normal as possible. And after the first two, three days, I prefer to keep the babies on the uh, air mode rather than servo mode because the servo mode tends to keep them in the warmer zone. So they are more likely to develop apnea in that. Uh, secondary apnea, obviously, uh, we will discuss when we discuss the differential diagnosis. So here the apnea is a manifestation of an underlying problem like sepsis or 